Sangitamu. This is Elena Ortiz calling in from Ogapoge Owinge, otherwise known as Santa Fe. And um, I'm the co-host of Red Power Hour along with Melanie Yazi, um, who is here with me. And we are finally going to be talking about Killers of the Flower Moon, which I have to admit, I dreaded watching and I hated every minute of it. And I had like PTSD after I watched it. So it's good that we waited this long because I had to process a lot. Um, so we're going to talk about Killers of the Flower Moon. The first um, hour will be um, on the free part. Free, I don't even know how to say that. The It will be free. The main um, feed. The free main, main feed. feed. Thank you. Um, and the total episode, depending on how much longer after an hour we go, um, will be behind the paywall. So if you want to listen to the whole episode, um, we encourage you to join our Patreon. Um, you can join for as little as $2 a month. We would appreciate $5 a month. We would appreciate anything at all. Your money goes to support um, Red Media and the Red Nation. It goes to support um, our efforts on Pine Ridge in South Dakota, Ocheri Sokoin territory. It goes to support efforts that we have in Albuquerque, um, Tiwa territory, um, and everything else that we do to, to be good relatives. So we appreciate any support. Um, let's just jump right into this film and talk about what we thought of it. Uh, I'll just share first about like initial reaction. You know, Elena, you said that it had been several weeks or months. I, I forgot when you watched this. It was last year, though. It was before New Year's. And you said you needed a buffer between watching it um, and talking about it. I did not do that. I watched this movie at the last possible minute before we <laughs> to record this episode, partly because I'm really busy with other things. And I was really, really not looking forward to watching the film. Um the length is definitely part of that because it's a real time investment, but I just knew, I just knew it was going to be a really rugged experience. And it was, I actually watched it. We were supposed to record this 24 hours ago, this episode. Um, and I am not going to lie. Like I got a migraine, like literally five minutes before we were supposed to record. And I 100% attribute that to having like a very visceral embodied reaction like I was sick to my stomach after watching this film and we'll kind of hash out why that is the case. I'm sure a lot of native women in particular who watched this film were also sick to their stomach. And after the first hour, um, I had to take a break after the first hour. There was like so much violence against native people, like really brutal violence and racism against native people in the first hour. I felt like I had already been watching it for three and then when I paused it, I was like, holy shit, there's still two more hours to go. And I had to really, uh, I had to force myself to watch it. Um, I couldn't take a break because I, I needed to be prepared <laughs> to record this episode. But I kind of feel like banging it out that way right before um, and then having to talk about it during the episode was a really bad idea um, because it made me physically ill to do so. So I've had like a day and a half of a buffer time, which I hope is enough time. But yeah, that's my initial response was, I mean, even after the first hour, I was quite literally nauseous. I was nauseous and dizzy, actually. Yeah. So I watched with my husband and my daughter and we were all like, I don't know, borderline stunned, just couldn't really, I mean, I needed that space because I couldn't really formulate a thought about it. The, the very first few minutes of that film, um, and, and I haven't talked about this really with anybody, but um, it felt like they were, so I, I don't know much about Osage culture, but they were um, burying a pipe. So my assumption was that the pipe carrier had 
passed and they, the entire community was in mourning. Everyone was crying. This was the death of not just an individual, but of a whole um, spiritual being. And the voiceover, um, our children will now be educated by white men. And it was very, it was very mournful. It was very sad. And then the very next shot you go to is oil and these young warriors dancing around with oil, which to me, the first thing I thought of, and I'm a little older was the Beverly Hillbillies. And it like freaked me out because you went from this sort of poignant scene um, to these people dancing around with oil as though you can replace the loss of spiritual knowledge or um, the loss of an elder and a, a spiritual leader with, with oil, with money. And so that was the very, like, that was the first five minutes of the film. And that disturbed me so much that I, I had to recover from that to watch the rest of the film. Yeah. I mean, but also that was, that's how you're introduced, right? That's the first five minutes of the film is what you're describing the juxtaposition between like this pipe being buried in the earth and whoever that medicine person is or spiritual leader is saying, you know, it's um, the indication is like the time of like the Osage way of life has passed and now we will adopt the white man's way. And then you have the oil um, and the next, you know, all these warriors bathing in oil, but that's not even what happened in the movie. That's what's really the, like narratively it like is such a bullshit way to set up the story. Cause it's not like, like the central character that Lily Gladstone plays Molly, who's a real person. I was actually looking up Molly online and looking up, um, some of her biography, Molly is a very spiritual person, speaks the language, like the language is very spoken fluently throughout the entire movie by a lot of different people. Um, there are multiple scenes of Molly praying, you know, in the Osage way, in the way that she and Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio's um, character get married. Uh, it's not like, it's not like just because these like Osage folks have, in, have a, adopted um like the revenue that comes from oil um which really only happened about what a decade before the movie takes place i think the movie takes place in 1917 or something is when it starts um there isn't really like a loss of culture from what i can tell there's a very interesting blending and like many contradictions for sure um in the way that osage people are navigating this kind of like new world and this new reality that they have in their lives. But I definitely wouldn't say that there's like language loss or culture loss from what I could tell. Um, so again, I don't, that's just like a weird um, like ethnographic and historical trope. It's also like a pop culture trope where it's like, Oh, native people are losing their way of life. And I don't even know why that was the opening for the movie. Because the movie itself, there's like three hours of that movie demonstrating that that isn't even what happened, <laughs> especially through the protagonist of Molly. Anyway, yeah, it's it's like it's like you see that that first five minutes, and it's kind of setting you up for a declension narrative, which the movie does exactly. not follow. Yeah, it, it it was it was very weird. It was almost like you know, the movie started with this, and you are set up to to expect something and then it takes an incredible you know right turn and um at that point i think i was off balance because so so many films about native people are declension narratives and like dances with woofs which you know if you haven't heard that podcast that we did several years ago you should listen to that because that it, this is a very different film and and in in so many ways um it's as awful just just way um way more 
clear about what the film is about without being aware of how clear it is. And I mean, this film is about subtle colonialism. It is like about the, the reality of settler colonialism and how, how the Osage were treated, but without being aware of it. I think Scorsese and everyone who's talked about these films, all of the white actors um, and Scorsese himself is th their intention their, their stated intentions for this film are absolutely not what I saw. And, and then I go back and I'm thinking about, you know, the, the brutality and the violence against women. And I'm thinking about Molly's sister, um, who's sort of the party girl and, and how she is killed and, and how brutal that was and how awful that was to watch. And then in the back of my brain, I'm thinking, yeah, but this book was was written, you know, by a guy who's based it all on the FBI papers. So of course, that's exactly what this is. And it's like it's like an FBI infomercial. Well, so I read a couple of interviews that Scorsese did with some major publications. The main one I might reference is one that appeared in the New Yorker back in November, I believe. And he he and Leonardo DiCaprio um were like on this project from the very beginning, kind of collaborating and trying to figure out how to tell the story. And of course it's an adaptation from the book Killers of the Flower Moon, like which you said is basically an infomercial for the FBI. And so Scorsese says that the movie was originally supposed to be much more centered on the FBI. Um, I think he called it like a, a serial, like a film about like really focusing on the FBI and the FBI narrative. And it was only um, after a certain amount of time that they changed their mind, that in fact, what the story should be centered on for the film ad adaptation is the quote unquote love story between Molly and Ernest, who Leonardo DiCaprio is, um, plays Ernest Burkhart. And so then they rewrote the entire script, apparently, um, and then brought on Lily Gladstone in the role of Molly. And so... The, we, I, I mean, he thinks that the movie, the through line and like the anchor of the film is the love story between Molly and Ernest, which uh, we're going to have to unpack that. Um, <laughs> I've actually had several conversations with folks about uh, that, um, especially Native people. And I will say really quickly, like... Um, I read some interviews that Lily Gladstone has also done about Killers of the Flower Moon. And she is very aware. And from what I could tell was very aware when she agreed to play Molly, that this was going to be received by Osage people, by Molly's family, um, cause she has actual living descendants, her son, and then her grandchildren, great grandchildren are all alive. So by Osage people, by Molly's family and her descendants, but then by Native people, specifically Native women, she was actually very concerned about the way the film was going to be um, received. And she actually said in one interview, she's like, I think Native people should go watch the movie together with other Native people. She says, because if you're just like alone or it's just like you in a theater with like non-Native people, primarily white American settlers, like who are laughing at inappropriate moments or who like are not understanding like what's going on, especially the level of violence and brutality that's depicted against native people. She's like, you're going to have a very different experience. And so she's actually very cognizant of like how this makes people feel like native people actually feel like viscerally. Um, and so I think opening up with our comments about that is really important because she herself understood that it was going to be really difficult. And I don't use the word traumatizing or traumatic very often because I'm very critical of that language, but she's like, yeah, this is going to be like very traumatizing for native people to watch. And it was, <laughs> but she apparently, she seems to be the only person, um, noteworthy person, you know, from the movie who is even remotely cognizant of that. I actually read a quote um, from Scorsese that came out in like November or December and he seemed like genuinely confused why native people were critical or like having a hard time watching it. And he was like, oh, the first hour, like native people seem to have a problem with that. I'm like the first hour, 
the entire movie. Like you don't even you don't even reveal how Anna, Molly's sister, gets murdered until like 20 minutes before the movie ends when all of the dudes who murdered all these women are being convicted in the court. And he was like, it's a quote unquote travesty that native people feel um, have experienced the watching the film um, as like a violation essentially, and have had such a strong reaction. I'm, I'm, I'm stunned by that from Scorsese. Like, honestly, he must be the stupidest person alive to not understand that. And part of what was also traumatizing, I'm sorry, I'm not going to use that word either. Part of what was also disturbing to me was the whole time that um, Molly is being poisoned by Ernest. That, uh, and you see her getting sicker and sicker, and it's being done through injections. And all I can think of is her as a woman, as a female, as an example of all native women who have been treated like this and as like our mother earth that has been devastated by the extractive industries, which is also, you know, this is about extractive industries. And this was about, this is about how you destroy native women by and through extractive industries. So I'm watching her in the bed and she's, without agency and she's without her own power she's without sovereignty and that pained me because i and I, I full disclosure i did not read the book um i don't really care about reading books by white people about um native people and particularly after reading the reviews of the book and, and realizing that it was basically all based on FBI papers, you know, I was like, Ugh, don't want to see that uh, or don't want to read that. But so you're watching um, in real time, you're watching what's happening to native women and what's happening to, you know, our mother earth in this film. And all of it is of course, in, in unintentional because Scorsese is clearly not intelligent enough to know what he's doing or how people are going to take it. And it just like hit me upside the head um, in so many ways. And I just hated it. Like I dreaded every minute of it, like what's going to happen next. And the thing that was also painful was that, you know, um, if you understand the story and, and that, you know, Molly does eventually um, leave and divorce Burkhart and she moves on with her life. So she does have agency and she does manage to survive that hideous relationship. Um, and yet you never see that, you never see, it. it's a postscript in the film. You don't actually get to see her living her true life. So if it was a love story, what kind of fucked up love has Scorsese had in his life? Wow. We're going to get to that. This is a version of love that comes from like a white settler masculine perspective that is so obvious and yet completely unaware and unconscious of itself. That's what the movie is actually about. And because that's what the movie is about, Molly or Lily Gladstone's character is simply the recipient and the receptacle for that violence that just pure and all of the Osage characters, especially the women, period. That's what the movie is about. And so here's this character that's written and Lily Gladstone, I swear, I, I would really love to have a conversation with Lily Gladstone because I swear Scorsese even says, or maybe Leonardo DiCaprio says this in another interview. They're like, Lily Gladstone could see things that we couldn't see. They actually acknowledge that. And I am telling you, I think Lily Gladstone knew all of this. Like, I think she understood all of it when she accepted this character. And she is hands down, like the anchor, the only reason you should watch this film 
But even then, she has to somehow represent, like what you said, she represents, and the way that she plays Molly, she represents the entire history and structure of white heteropatriarchal settler violence. Because as Audra Simpson has argued before in a piece called The State is a Man, the, the violation of Native women's bodies is constitutive of settler colonialism in a place like Canada, but certainly in a place like the United States. And so settler order is made and remade quite literally through and inscribed onto the bodies of Native women. And why is this the case? You just said it, right? It's because Native women represent the alternative political orders that underground, that underwrite sovereignty, Indigenous sovereignty. We have relationships with the land. We are the primary actors in social and biological reproduction for our nations. Our, our, our lives, our very presence, right? It represents the alternative political orders that pre-exist the United States. Um, and so to destroy that, to disappear that is a very necessary process. Um, it's a necessary target for settler colonialism because then settler colonialism, you know, can claim or settler nation states like the U.S. can claim that that project is done, right? That there are there's no alternative to U.S. nationalism. There is no alternative to private property and white supremacy, right? Um, and so this is a mainstay kind of argument within the literature and the politics of indigenous feminism. And I mean, I'm not saying that Lily Gladstone is like an academic, like a scholar the way that I am, but I'm pretty sure she actually understood all of these things. And so the way that she plays Molly, because Molly has no agency other than how she is expected to respond to the really grotesque, perverse, just a massive volume of violence. Um, she is there to, she has to represent the land. She has, to, she's there to represent memory, Osage memory. She has to represent Osage sovereignty. She has to represent like Osage femininity, right? And the way that she has to be able to protect herself. Um, and she very much plays the character that way. She doesn't actually have a lot of spoken lines, but she is somehow able through her eyes and through her face um, and the expressions I think to demonstrate the comp just the complexity of all of that, but I feel like the fact that she had to represent that entire weight in history of the entire structure of settler violence and Native women is like all for what? The whims of Martin Scorsese and like Leonardo DiCaprio who are like, this is a cool story to tell. We wanted to write a Western and like, you know, I was like, I was really interested in doing this movie. I, it's just incredibly disgusting. And it's just a, it's a, it's a manifestation and an expression of the very thing that we're talking about, the, the very way that her character is written. And I, she's nominated for an Oscar, you know, for this role. Leonardo DiCaprio did not get nominated. Robert De Niro got nominated for, because he's like the most disgusting character in the whole movie. He got nominated for a supporting actor role for an Oscar, but there's also something really perverse about Lily Gladstone possibly getting like recognized and awarded for bearing, like surviving, playing this character who's not a character. It's a real woman who also had to survive this. There's something like meta about the movie that is also profoundly disturbing, but Lily Gladstone is a fucking queen <laughs> yes. I, I i the fact that she did that and she did it so powerfully she's a powerful woman she played molly powerfully in this film i'm just like i don't know i should i just burst into flames every time she was on screen um but in a good way because i was like damn this woman is slaying this role like this she's not just playing this character she's like representing native women in this movie even though she's surrounded, literally surrounded constantly by these white men who are encircling her like a pack of wolves and who are all trying to kill her constantly. Yep. In, in, yeah, everything you just said and Lily Gladstone is like the queen. The fact that she could manifest 
everything with her facial expression and her eyes, considering how badly written and underwritten her character was. And she had no action. Well, you know, we already said she's no, she had no agency, but everything in the film was done to her and she reacted. There were no place, there was no place in the film where she acted and, and I mean, her character did not, did not produce action. Um, her character produced reaction when things were done to her. And I think about how powerful she must be to have played that character as passively as she did with so few lines, just with her eyes and her expressions. But I also think, in, in my opinion, DiCaprio and Robert De Niro don't deserve to be nominated because they were literally just acting like white, white heteropatriarchal men. I mean, that's what they were. That's what they are. And so, because they're favorites of Scorsese, that's all that's they're literally just playing themselves. They're always exactly. that character because Scorsese is really obsessed with white settler masculinity in like yep. all of his movies. Yep. So it wasn't such a stretch for them. I think it was a stretch for her because I think in from what I've read um, interviews with her and just seen her and also we've seen her in in Reservation Dogs and she oh was so oh. yeah, unbelievable. So I I think that you know her her acting was intentional and she had um, she had the agency as an actor to play that role although the character had no agency and yeah I do I mean I think you're right I don't know other than than from what you just said I do think she knew what she was doing and what she was representing and. People have said all along, Osage people have said, um, this story needed to be told. And I agree, this story needed to be told. It needed to be told from an Osage perspective. It needed to be told from a Native perspective. It needed to be told by Native people, by Native filmmakers. And she said that too. Yeah. And that's the tragedy about this is that this story has been told and it's been told in the worst possible way. And the fact that it's a true story, yeah, someone could go back and make a different version of it, not from that book. But this will always be out there. And it's it's just, it's, it's sad that this is the version that we got. Because I don't think this is the version that the Osage deserved. Not at all. And Lily Gladstone is on the record in interviews saying, like, this movie should have been made by Native people. And... Again, I think that just reinforces that, you know, because there are there are obviously many Native actors in the film representing various Osage people, including her family. Tantu Cardinal, who's a legend, is her mom, also has like three lines or whatever. She just like sits in the corner a lot <laughs> in the film, yeah. which is also really bizarre to me. But um, And Tatanka Means, who's like a cop. Yeah, he's a cop. He's a cop. It's like, cool. Um but really the entire, the weight of like, the weight of the native perspective, there was no native perspective in the film. The film was not written to provide an Osage perspective. Lily Gladstone got this shit character that, that these white dudes had written. And then she like, by like the grace of her remarkable skills from what I can tell as an actor, and as a native person who has principles and ethics in relationship to how she plays native people and how it's going to be received by native people. She is the person who injected the power into that character because she actually understood what it was going to mean. You know, when the movie came out, it clearly was done in spite of the ignorance and just like the complete lack of awareness of Scorsese and, you know, like the other white dudes who, cause not only in the movie, is she as Molly encircled by these, this pack of white men who are just these parasitic white men who are just circling the native people constantly. Um, she also, I think was probably surrounded by that same, a similar pack in the actual making of the film because the people who had the power in the making of the film 
was also like a circle of white men. <laughs> I can tell. And so, yeah, I, she, she made just that one role. The rest of the film is insignificant. Um, I would say in terms of the way that native stories are told, like in the history of American cinema, but Lily Gladstone and what she did with that role is very significant, I would say. And that is because she, from what I can tell, is a very powerful, very thoughtful native woman who's a good fucking relative to native people. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, you know, if it wasn't for her, the, the pack of wolves wouldn't have had anything to react to um, because she was able to make that character so strong. They were able to act um, around her because she was the center of this. And it's, it's to her, to her credit that this film has done as well as it, it has. Um, and I agree. I mean, it should have been done by, it should have been done by Osage people. It should have been done by native filmmakers. The, the other thing, this film, which, you know, Scorsese and DiCaprio said, you know, we went to Osage ceremonies. We talked to Osage people. Um, we wanted to make this more about the Osage, but there was nothing in that film that reflected native values at all. And, you know, maybe it's not fair that I'm critiquing everything based on how reservation dogs is, but there was no representation of native values in that you didn't see any sense of community. You didn't see any sense of, um, of, women elevating women and protecting women. There was one scene where I think it was the tribal council or the council of elders who get together and said, we have to stop. We have to stop what's being done to our women. And yet you see there's one scene, it's two or three minutes, and then you don't see anything else. So they appear ineffectual. They appear um, completely um, weak and I'm pretty sure that's not what the Osage Tribal Council was like. Um, so I think it did it did them no favors at all. And if they were trying to elevate the Osage presence, if they were trying to elevate the Osage people, they didn't. They really made them look terrible. And that made me angry. That's interesting. Um, in one of her other interviews, and I've actually had this question. So I was teaching a, a upper level undergraduate course on like indigenous politics and tribal governments last semester. And I had some students who had seen the movie and were asking me questions. And I was like, I haven't seen the movie. I can't quite answer. But one of the central things that I have heard um, over the last several months since the movie came out in the fall uh, is this question of like, well, why did she stay, right? Like if she knew the Burkhardt, she already knew that the uncle was like a dangerous, was a bad man. You know, she already knew the uncle was a bad man. And it's very, you at least you can presume given like the way that she talks and like the, it's intimated, I guess, in the film. Um, and she, I think she also suspects Ernest very early on of participating in things. I mean, he's like a grave robber too. Um, he don't, not, doesn't just participate in killing her actual sisters and her family members. But the question that I got um, from a lot of people who had seen the film was like, well, why did she stay? And so Scorsese and DiCaprio answer that question by saying like, oh, because she was in love with Ernest. And like love can, love is blind, right? This like adage or whatever. But in the interview that Lily um, Gladstone did, she was like, so the question is, why did she stay? She's like, she stayed because it's her land. She is from that place. That is Osage land. And that's why she stayed. And I was like, you go, Lily. <laughs> like, exactly. It's not because she loved Ernest Burkhardt. It's because that's yep. her fucking land. And that's her home. Yep. And I guess the reason why I'm saying this in relationship to what you just said is that the way that Osage people are written, including these like council people and the men um, the people who get murdered, the many Osage people who get murdered. And then, of course, like 
Lily Gladstone's character, Molly, there it's written more as like a victimization narrative. And, and how could it, it could easily be that because the amount of violence and just like the premeditated hatred and mutilation and brutality against native people. And the fact that like literally every single white person in that place is like in on it is like in on like the conspiracy to just like murder and displace and maim all of these native people. And they fucking hate them to their very core, but they just want their money, right? They just want the money and the land and the oil. Like the sheer intensity of the predation is also, we can talk more about this. That was something that was really difficult to watch. And so how could the Osage people in the film be anything but like prey, right? The prey of this predation, the victims of this predation. And again, Lily Gladstone, she turns that on her head. She's like, no, this isn't about victimization. This is my land. You know, this is Molly's land. Like you're the outsider. You're the person who's coming in here and causing all of these problems. And there definitely are moments where I guess the person is supposed to be playing the chief, the Osage chief of the tribal council. He does say these things, right? And so I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I feel like the, the native people who played some of those key roles, including Lily Gladstone, again, I think tried to inject that like anti-colonial, I guess for lack of a better word, agency um, into those roles. Uh, but I, I, I do not trust that Scorsese is intelligent enough or aware enough to have directed them to infuse those lines with that spirit or that vibe. Um, no, I agree. I mean, ultimately it was the Earth Age Council who paid to have Molly and others travel to Washington because they 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 were well aware. They knew exactly what was going on. Um, they weren't ignorant. They weren't, you know, um, they weren't pretending it wasn't happening. And so ultimately they went to, to D.C. and it was because of that presence in D.C. that they sent out that that FBI task force or whatever it was. And yeah, they weren't going to go anywhere. They, they, they needed to have it stopped, but they needed to have it stopped in situ. They, they, it had to happen right there. They weren't going to leave. They weren't going to abandon. They weren't going to give up their land, their territory. So whatever was going to happen, whatever was going to come to a head, it had to happen there. So they, went to DC to see if they could, could uh, get some help. And, and so they did have agency. It's just that that's not focused on. Instead with the shots in the film, it just looked like they were helpless. And that, that was not according to Scorsese elevating the Osage people. To me, that was, that was just um, making them look incompetent. Well, and the, the term incompetent was a legal term. There are two scenes. Um, actually, the first time you meet Molly on screen at the very beginning of the movie, she has to go into her guardian, her white guardian, to ask for permission to take out a few hundred dollars for something for her family. You know, the white, the, the, her legal guardian, she's, she's deemed incompetent. And this is something that happened, particularly through the head right system for Osage people after the oil boom happened. She, I mean, Molly, my under, if I read it correctly, Molly's head rights were worth like several million dollars, even back in like the early 1920s, which today would be like tens of millions of dollars, right? And here she has to beg her legal guardian, right? For a few hundred dollars. Um, and she has to say, I'm incompetent, right? In order to begin the transaction and the haggling with this guy to have access to her money, um, and the, I, again, I couldn't tell, even though I don't, again, I just don't think Scorsese's like intelligent enough to have done this on purpose, but I was like, the fact that she has to call herself incompetent 
And the second time she goes in to ask for money and she says, I'm incompetent. It's just this one scene that's spliced between completely unrelated storylines. So it's very, it stands alone. And there's these moments, um, these like bookmarks, I guess, throughout our bench, bench bookmarks throughout the film where there's like an exposition, um, an expositional moment where you're made aware that native people are being treated as like less than human as, and obviously this relates back to the ward guardian relationship. That is one of the central tenets of, of U S federal Indian policy. Um, and there are a lot of guardians and especially like predatory guardians, um, and patriarchs throughout, uh, throughout the film. But it's like, I couldn't tell if the film was forcing the audience in those moments to think critically about the fact that native people are put into the position where they are deemed incompetent. Or if the film was just like, oh, this is just the language they used at the time. This is something white historians do a lot too, where they're like, oh, like the reason why there's so much racism in this book is because that's just the way people talked in that day and age in the 1920s. And so it's not racist. Like you have to portray things accurately. And there are other things in the movie that felt very much like there was like anti-Semitism. There is anti-Blackness in the movie. You know, the KKK is openly marching through the streets in one scene. Um, obviously, like what happened in Tulsa and the burning down of like that Black Wall Street essentially is also something that kind of threaded in a few times in the film. And I have a very strong feeling that what Scorsese or the film's writers were doing was making more of like that kind of like typical gesture where it's like, oh, this was just the way things were at the time versus making a political point um, about the nature of settler colonialism and how unbelievably racist it is to force native people to call themselves incompetent on their own fucking land. Right. Um, yeah. Or to represent them as weak. Yeah. And I think there were there was a lot of um, references to land and, and De Niro's character makes a few of them references to the land and wanting the land and um, and yet it was never really explained. Like the, the the head rights was never really explained. The allotment act was never really explained. And it's very different if you grew up in the Southwest um, and well, we did um, like our lands were, were never, um, we never had allotment. We never had private ownership of land. Um, our land is, and there's issues with this too, of course, is held in trust by the federal government. So, you know, in my community, um, I can have land, I can live on the land, I can pass the land down, but I will never own it. And if I stop having descendants, it will revert back to the tribe. And um, so this idea of land all of allotment was very, very different in Oklahoma than it is anywhere else. But I don't think that was explained. And I don't think it was explained how that structure created another form of genocide that um, stripped people from their land, that left them with um, with what would be traditionally Osage homelands in the possession of white settlers because of the structure of it and because you could sign away your head rights and because you could have children with these with these white men, and then they would be um, they would inherit the land. And ultimately, if they um, procreated with non Osage people, ultimately you have a whole bunch of Osage land which was literally just stripped away from the Osage people. And that happened a lot in Oklahoma. It happened a lot, not just with the Osage, but the Cherokee and the Choctaw and any of the the tribes that were moved forcibly removed. Um, and settled in Oklahoma. So you have you have this white heteropatriarchal violence um, as genocide, as one level of genocide, but also you have the, the complete 
um, dispossession of these tribes and the complete stripping of land um, from these people through what was considered legal means. Yeah, I, if you don't mind me having a nerd moment, but I feel like it might be important to define what a head right is because the film did not explain it. And um, so I'm referencing a book called, I'll put it here, Colonial Entanglements. It's by an Osage scholar, um, an anthropologist named Jean Dennison, who is a citizen of the Osage Nation. So she just writes, the story of Osage oil, a tale of wealth and prosperity is also a classic tale of colonization. Um, she says the 1906 Osage Allotment Act created the Osage Mineral Estate as part of the unique deal struck between the Osage and the Office of Indian Affairs, who wanted to open up Indian country through the Allotment Act for white settlement and statehood. The surface of the Osage Reservation was allotted, but the subsurface, including rights to oil, natural gas, and other minerals, was left under national control, meaning national Osage control, to be distributed to those listed on the 1906 Osage Rule. And so there was a distinction between the, the allotment of surface land, um, but the nationalization essentially of subsurface land or rights, which was the mineral estate. Um, and even she's writing this book about a 2006 constitutional reform process. So even in 2006, um, only those Osage who descend from the 1906 role uh, have rights to the, um, the revenue produced by the mineral estate. So like the production of oil and natural gas, et cetera. Um, and they constitute a very powerful governing body within the Osage nation. Um, up until 2006, I don't know if that's still the same today. But in 1921, she also writes, the US Congress went so far as to pass a law that non-competent, right? Osage, generally those listed as having over one half Indian blood, so it was racialized, could have access to only $4,000 of their annuitant payments per year. Um, and at its peak in 1925, when each annuitant earned $13,200 a quarter, many people came onto the Osage reservation as legal guardians, merchants, suitors, swindlers, and murderers um, in search of access to or advantage in acquiring this wealth, which I'm sure made it even more difficult because the, the, the allotment and the carving up of Indian territory in general, including Osage land, the surface rights, meant that there were probably a lot of white prospectors and white um, property owners who benefited from allotment who were in such close proximity to Osage people physically because of allotment. Um, you get the sense in the film actually that the it's not even encroachment, it's just being progressively squeezed to death or just sucked dry. Like this is what happens to Molly. She's literally encircled. I remember the scene where her mom is sitting on her bed or whatever in the living room of, of the house that they share. And there's all of these white people in her house. This is after she marries Ernest. And I'm, and a lot of them are like staff or like um, the maids and the cooks and stuff. But there's always just these white people, all of these like hangers on eating her food and literally squatting in her house. And there's this scene where like these older people, I literally don't know who they are. Are they like Ernest's parents? Are they the grandparents? Are they just random white people in Molly's house? Molly's in her mom's house. And they're sitting across the, the dining table from Molly and Ernest's kids who are mixed, right? Cause she's Osage and he's white. And they're just saying these incredibly racist things about their mixed blood kids whilst they're eating Molly's food, the food that Molly paid for. And her mom is looking with like total disgust at this scene from the living room. And I mean, like, there were like 30 white people in Molly's house and there was no explanation as to why they were there. And I guess I'm talking about that scene because I think it really exemplifies like the, the insanity of settler colonialism where you, where you dispossess and you carve up surface land that creates a, a context where these white folks are literally like, the encroachment just gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And there's almost like an intimacy because of the pro the literal proximity of settlers to you as an Osage person on your own land that they now own because of allotment. But at the same time, because you have rights to what's below the land still, and they want the money from that, they're just like all up in your grill. They're just trying. So not only have they taken all of your land, but they're trying to take all of the money and everything that you still quote unquote have a right to. And so anyway, I, I was thinking a lot about these like layers, quite literal layers of um, settler colonialism in the film. Um, and it, 
and you just get the sense that Molly and like all of these Osage people are just being squeezed dry. I just kept thinking like, even my body got really tense. It's just like more and more and more until like the chokehold is so strong that then they, they all just die. <laughs> Literally in the film, like everyone just dies. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's like it's like it's like a giant constrictor, yep. and it's just surrounding the. Yeah, I thought that scene like in closer, in, closer. in her dining room or whatever was also very disturbing, and I couldn't figure out who those people were either. I think um, some of them were related. So so Robert De Niro's character's name I can't remember, but but he he was Ernest's uncle, and King so Hale. His, Okay. And and so I think they were, yeah, they were part of that whole family, but yeah, they said some horrible things and, and they are, they're sitting there like taking up space in her house and living off of her money and being, and the anti-Indianness is just so blatant and the things they're saying are so disgusting. Yeah. That was a very disturbing scene too. Good God. And even Robert De Niro's character, I know I'm just kind of like riffing now, I'm not moving seamlessly into strong points, but every time he talks about like the um, Roan Horace, White Horse, Molly's first husband, who is like a works for Hale, I, you know, Robert De Niro's character, the uncle, Uncle Hale or whatever, they call him King Hale, I think in the film. But he he's also the way that that character is written there's a lot of you as an audience member, you have to like connect the dots about him. It's very obvious that he's like orchestrating all of the murders. Um, and he's obviously like a very crooked, he's like a gangster type person in the film. He's like a kingpin, I guess, for lack of a better word. But he's also like a deputy, he's been deputized. Um, so he's part of the sheriff's posse. He's very wealthy. He has a lot of power. It, I mean, you obviously in the film, you can tell that he has a lot of power. But when he talks about the native people, when he talks about the Osage people, including this guy who's his quote unquote friend, um, who he ends up murdering, uh, who works for him, it's a, uh, he'll say, oh, the Osage, they're, they're amazing. They're wonderful people. They're so intelligent and strong or whatever. He'll say something like positive, And then at the very next breath, he'll say something profoundly racist, like, when he finds out that Ernest and Molly are going to have a third child, he's like, he says something to the effect of like, how can you lay with a squaw or something like that? You know, because it's like native people are, are um, animals. And so it's like, how can you lay with an animal? And then it's, then he's like, oh, but this is a wonderful news. And like, and then you also find out that he has also either raped or had like intercourse with Anna Oh, he makes this passing comment too, um, because she was pregnant apparently when she was murdered, and so he he represents. Um, I think he is really the epitome of settler colonialism. And what's funny is that I don't think Scorsese or the people who the men who wrote the movie meant for him to epitomize the vicissitudes of settler colonialism, but he really does. Um, and I can go more into that and like why I think that and see that in his character. But yeah. Yeah. He really, he really represents the, I, I, I was just thinking that same thing when you said it, like he's the epitome of um, settler colonialism. He's the epitome of, of white heteropatriarchal violence. He is, he is every um, oil company. He is every, um, you know, everyone who 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 works um, extractive industries. He's everyone who's 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 made a fortune off native land and given no thought at all to the impact. I mean, he's 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 J. Robert Oppenheimer. He is, you know, he is everything um, that that epitomizes the rape of the land and the rape of the women. Um, exactly. And and he, I, I don't, I don't think 
I don't think Scorsese had any clue. I don't think De Niro has any clue because they're, they come from a privileged class. They come from, um, from a group of filmmakers who don't give any thought to the reality on the ground. And I don't think, I mean, as much as, as Lily Gladstone has praised Leonardo DiCaprio, I don't think he has any clue either. <clears throat> I think he, I think that character, I think Ernest was meant to be um, sympathetic, more sympathetic than oh, that's Robert what I've Henry. heard a lot of people say too. And I found him worse because there's the guy at the top who's directing all of the the um, the action, and then there's the people who actually do it. And if at any point during that film or during his life, he had said, I am not going to keep poisoning my wife. I love her. Then maybe things would have been different, but he didn't. He just, he continued to kill her day after day after day. And I, I think in a way he was way worse. I mean, he killed her entire family. And yes, Uncle King Hale, whatever, ordered him to do it. But he was married to her he already had enough money to live on the rest of his life. Why would he need to keep taking orders? And it, it, he didn't. He did it because that's the that's just inherent in white settler colonialism is that you keep doing it until there's nothing left to destroy. There's that that just rapacious nature of settler colonialism that will never that will never stop until there's nothing left to take. Word. I mean, you find out, I don't, maybe an hour, 45 minutes into the film that he's grave robbing. He even robs her sister, her first sister, Minnie. I believe it's Minnie, um, Molly's sister who passes away from quote unquote wasting disease. But then you're also like, did that happen? Or was she murdered by like her white husband, you know? Um, and they're robbing the graves of all of these Osage people because they're buried with beautiful things, probably to take them. And I don't know what Osage funerary practices are. Um, so he's grave robbing. It, he's grave robbing. And then he murders her family and then he's trying to murder her, but then he'll like have sex with her at, but then he'll like eat her food and live in her house, but then he'll like plot to destroy her people but then he's also like loves his kids, but then he also says really racist things to her. There are definitely like a few moments in the movie he calls her a stupid bitch at one point when she doesn't want the doctors to administer her insulin because she's worried that they're poisoning her and trying to kill her. And he gaslights, he actually, he more than anyone else in the entire film gaslights the fuck out of Molly like because he's so intimately intertwined with her and they're married right they share the same bed they share the same home he gaslights her even up to the very end when after the trial and he like comes clean about all of the shit that's happened and they're sitting but this is right when she leaves him finally or she doesn't leave him because she doesn't leave the land because it's her fucking land she's just finally like i'm not going to be married to you anymore She's like, let's reveal all the secrets. And she asks him, she's like, were you poisoning me? Basically, what did you, what were you putting in the insulin? And he still denies it. And so I think that's what makes his character really like the worst is because he's like the foot soldier for um, like that settler masculine, um, white settler masculine violence. But then he's gaslighting her constantly and of course, the effect of the gaslighting is so that he can get closer and closer and closer and deeper and deeper and deeper into her psyche, into her soul, into her spirit. And he's just feeding. He's just fucking feeding like a vampire the whole time. And then he's feeding that information to like his uncle, to Robert De Niro's character, who then can utilize that information to continue to enact brutality and violence against her family and other Osage people. He's like hands down the most insidious, dis 
disgusting. Actually, it's hard to just, it's hard to decide which of those white men is the most insidious, disgusting person in the story. But yeah, Ernest really takes the cake. <laughs> he really does. I, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the Daenera character is King Hale is, is awful because he's like the puppet master. Um, and, and he's, so he's doing all of these, he's, you know, playing with all of these people, um, the, um, Ernest, but also, um, everyone else that you see sort of get cameos of, um, that has done the killing, um, and the bomb, like, like the guy who creates the bomb, um, that blows up right next to their house. And, um, you see all of these, these characters that are just being played and, and King Hale is offering them money. And then, you know, he turns around and kills them because he doesn't want them to testify against him. And he's really the puppet master, but I think it takes a special kind of evil to sleep with someone um, and have kids with someone and live with someone day after day after day that you're plotting to kill for their money that you, you know, you have so little respect for their feelings and their, um, their community that you kill their entire family or you protect the people who've killed their entire family. And, and, and this is, you know, like when I was talking about comparing films or media created by native um, media producers, you, you have a sense of community. You have a sense of, of the values of native people. And here you had, you had nothing like, like there was no sense of community. There was no sense of, of, of the values of native people. And it was so disturbing to watch this film. And especially um, with Scorsese saying, this is really about the Osage people, but if it's really about the Osage people, why aren't Osage values upheld? Why aren't they displayed? And you don't ever see them. You see sort of these, these weak little, um, protestations, but no, um, no action. You don't ever see the action, even though there was action. Well, and also, and now that I'm really thinking about it, there isn't a single fucking scene in three hours, three hours and 26 minutes of this movie where Osage people are allowed to be on screen without a white person in the scene with them. And so they're even like the tribal council meeting that's happening in what I'm presuming is like the traditional structure. I don't know what that's called because um, of my ignorance about Osage um, governance, the traditions of Osage governance, but there's white people sitting in there. And then Robert De Niro, he's just like the, the camera pounds out and then here's fucking Robert De Niro, who's everywhere. Always. He's always at the, at all of the celebrations. He's at the ceremonies. He's at the tribal council meetings. He's like in people's houses constantly. He's just like this fucking creeper omniscient he, he's not omniscient he's omnipresent and i think that's why he represents settler colonialism but he really represents like the paternalism of of this the colonial um technology of guardianship that native people have been subjected to so there's no opportunity for osage people to demonstrate um any type of like osage way of understanding like how to respond or like osage values because those values are always in the film, they're always placed in juxtaposition to and in response to the insidious encroachment of Robert De Niro, really, Robert De Niro's character. He's got his fingers in literally everything. And I, I doubt that that was true. I doubt that there were places where Osage people didn't have separation or secret meetings you know, or resistance, I guess, that didn't involve those truly disgusting um, white settler men who were preying on them. And can we just for a moment talk about the FBI being set up or constructed as the savior of this whole movie 
which is, it would be laughable if it wasn't so just disgusting. And I really, I'm curious um, as to, I mean, I realized that this was the beginning. This was really the, the, the infancy of the FBI. And they're sent out to Osage country to solve these murders. And, you know, J. Edgar Hoover is, is, is sort of, you know, shadowy in the background of, of all of this, but the FBI was really, um, you know, they're the ones who, who solved that would, they're the ones who solved what was going on, although everybody knew what was going on. So it didn't take, you know, a rocket scientist to figure it out. But to see that and to have the FBI elevated in that way, when the FBI has been the, the worst enemy of Native people since its inception and lying and murdering and I mean, literally working hand in hand with outside agencies to steal land, to- To destroy to kill, movements. To destroy movements, to kill activists. And to see that, um, it, it was just, it, I mean, I, I don't need, my brain was just exploding at that point. Um, and then Tatanka means, which I thought was just, almost hysterical irony that he's an FBI agent. Um, but yeah, it was a little much. Well, the book, certainly. And then like the initial approach to the film was supposed to glorify the FBI even more, like even more. Um, and so what, what actually ended up in the movie and on the big screen is like a, a profoundly watered down version of the celebration of the FBI. Uh, but even then, um, like what you're saying, it was laughable. It was laughable. Um, fuck the FBI. All you need to do is know the story of Leonard Peltier, our uncle Leonard Peltier and his imprisonment um, to know who the FBI really is when it comes to native people. And this is by no means some sort of present day judgment on the Osage or Molly for going to DC and like asking, basically inviting the FBI to come out and investigate. They were utilizing the tools and the resources that they had at that time to try to stop these fucking settlers from murdering their people. And so that's what they were trying to do. They were just trying to like stop people from getting their relatives from being murdered. That's what they were trying to do. They absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, and they were trying to behave appropriately given their their position um, on their own land and had this, there was this assumption that as citizens of the U.S. and as um you know what they thought of as uh, as living in in uh, following the rules of this country and living appropriately in this country that this country would afford them the same protection that it did white citizens and I think that was a, a sort of a naive um, belief but I think they behaved I think the Osage Nation behaved appropriately and and then you know, with this sort of nascent FBI um, beginning to to form, um, no one knew really what it was going to become. And yeah, and what it became was this fascist group of, of, um, I don't even know, um, enforcers that would hook up with anyone and everyone 
in order to prevent native people from exercising their sovereignty, protecting their land, protecting their people, and has become just the biggest joke around Indian country. I mean, I, I think it's, it's just bizarre to see how it's portrayed, how the FBI is portrayed in this film. And then you look at, you know, anything that's been done in the last 20 or 30 years and, um, and the FBI is just, are just these, these, you know, evil enforcers who, who have killed wantonly and at will and almost always um, warriors like, you know, like Leonard Peltier and others during that, that time period who were just trying to protect and um, protect the land, protect the people and exercise sovereignty. And the, in that right there, again, there's no awareness of history at all by these, by Scorsese or the folks, um, the white men who wrote this movie, that the FBI is the exact same as the Robert De Niro characters, as the Hales. Um, I mean, the FBI murdered dozens of AIM activists and other native people in the 70s and the 80s. Um, the FBI is responsible, they're serial killers. You know, the FBI is responsible for the mass murder of native people in the 20th and the 21st century. And the way that COINTELPRO infiltrated and destroyed native movements, um, especially in the 70s and the 80s, um, is and another example. Panthers. And the Black Panthers, yeah. right, also murdered many black yep. Ameri many black folks, radical black folks in the US is also another example of this like, I've still, I'm still not, cause I, I'm, I only watched this a day and a half ago and I'm still trying to find the language. I actually wanna write about this. The intimacy of that kind of settler, white settler masculine violence um, to infiltrate an organization or a group of people and to turn native people against each other and to utilize sex and drugs and alcohol and relationships and kinship um, and conflict uh, to, to do that, which is what COINTELPRO did. It was like psychological warfare. There's a certain kind of proximity and intimacy to that that is so profoundly insidious and disgusting that the FBI has perpetrated that type of uh, colonial violence against native people, especially revolutionaries and, and freedom fighters. There, that is no different than the exact same kind of like intimate, like insidious, intimate um, colonial violence that Ernest um, enacted against Molly, like literally sleeping, weaseling his way into her bed and into her heart and into her family and into her home and then destroying, destroying the integrity of that from within. That's literally what the FBI does <laughs> to native people. And so for them to like, there's some sort of like, retrospective, um, looking at the FBI like 100 years earlier. So this movie came out in 2023 and this is taking place in like 2020 or 1924 or something um, when the FBI actually gets involved um, after all these murders have been going on for quite some time. It's like we're looking back somehow on the FBI as like a, some sort of heroes or like friends to Native people. And it's like, nah, they're just like the modern, they're just modern day Indian killers, just like the Hales and the Burkharts of the 1920s in Osage territory. There's the same, again, they're the same violent settler, white settler, mass male archetype as all of these other ones. And that's, that's what was wild about the film. It was literally like all of the really vile um, white settler, vile archetypes of white settler masculinity that reproduce their kinship and their ontology through violence against the land, through the rape of the land and the rape of the people, particularly women, native women. That's literally what that movie was about. Scorsese said, can I say this real quick? I know I'm like ranting, but um, when asked like what the politics of Killers of the Flower Moon was or are, he said something to the effect of like, 
All right. So um, I wanted to pivot here uh, to something that I read that Scorsese said about when he was asked by uh, uh, in an interview in The New Yorker about uh, the politics of the film. Um, he said, and I'm going to paraphrase, this is in The New Yorker, that he's very interested in the Protestant work ethic of a certain set of like white immigrants, essentially, um, to what the fledgling United States and then what later became the United States. And he says he, he's interested in the political and the power structure that came out of that and that stays with it. But then in reference to Killers of the Flower Moon, he, he basically says that this, even though there's a power structure that comes out of this like positive, what he thinks is a positive um, Protestant work ethic of certain settlers in the United States, that the Killers of the Flower Moon story covers kind of like an unfortunate incident in an otherwise positive story, <laughs> essentially about um, the Protestant work ethic. And so he, he acknowledges that there's a structure that comes out of that, but he doesn't name what that structure is. It's, and he call, it's like a persistent structure of power. And we're naming it obviously as settler colonialism. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because Right. There is there is this obsession um, and it's part of like the industry of apologia um, and w w in in settler societies and settler nation states like the U.S. and Canada, where you apologize for a past wrong. First of all, assuming that that's something that happened in the past, it was an unfortunate chapter in the history of American progress. Right. What's being told in Killers of the Flower Moon. But that happened 100 years ago. And like, we've moved on from there. And so thinking of settler colonialism and Audra Simpson, again, brilliantly has talked about this where she's like settler colonialism. Well, I guess she hasn't, I mean, Patrick will said this, but it's a, <clears throat> it's a structure. It's not an event. It's not like there is this horrible example of settler violence. That's like being that happened in like 1924 or whatever. And we've been able to move past that. And we're going to apologize for that. And we're going to heal from it. And we're going to move forward. Scorsese himself even admits that this is a persistent structure of power. And so Killers of the Flower Moon, yes, is like technically about something that happened at a certain moment in history in a very specific kind of geopolitical context. But the way that Scorsese and the writers, this white settler writers who created the world through the movie, who imagined this movie into existence, have written about this historic event is like literally the settler unconscious of the present, meaning it is representative of the structure that Scorsese himself even talks about in one of his interviews. And what's interesting about that though, is that I don't even think he is aware that he has he is so profound, apparently, he's so profoundly invested in settler colonialism and white settler masculinity that he unknowingly made a film about himself and about that. Do you get right? And that's what's like really bizarre about the whole movie. So again, it's about a historic event, an unfortunate chapter in history, but it's literally, it represents the structure itself. And, and the fact that they don't see it is, is almost laughable in that they're cre they created these characters that were so heinous and so awful consciously, but they didn't realize they were looking in the mirror when they created them. And there's that, that denial that, that's a very, it's a very neoliberal sort of um, denial that, like you said, you're, you're, you're discussing a moment in time. You're not discussing a structure. Yet, if you look at what's happening throughout Indian country today with the stripping of um, Navajo water rights, with 
um, the continued pollution from um, Los Alamos and the fact that that um, the national labs in Los Alamos won't will keep paying fines in perpetuity rather than clean up what they've done, which is impacting um, native nations. And you look at um, the, the, the no dapple movement and all of the pipelines that um, are crossing Indian country. And that structure continues and grows and is like, um, just, just like a plague across the land but they're only focusing on this happened once and and now we're all going to live happily ever after because the FBI came in. We created the FBI to come in and fix it and the FBI fixed it and now it's all better. Um, and, and it, it, you know, I guess it would be it would be laughable if it wasn't so pitiful or like that, on the nose. Yeah. Of like how settler colonialism is actually operating like today. <laughs> Their lack of awareness about what they produce is really pitiful. And it's actually like really funny. Um, but the message of the film is so of now. Again, the structure of settler colonialism, right? As, as Audra Simpson has said in The State is a Man. Settler colonialism operates. It's literally inscribed on the bodies of native women, like the torture and the murder and the violation and the disappearance of native women is required for settler colonialism to reproduce itself. And that the people who populate like the settler colonial ontology and attitudes who perform and enact the violence on native women are primarily white men white settler men and and then right then this creates like the power structure the structure of power that Scorsese is talking about and so what's so interesting then about the movie going back to what we were talking about at the very beginning is that this movie is not a declension narrative which is what pretty much all westerns have been because Scorsese is like we want to make a western like he was intent on making a western he wanted to get into that genre and so the movie very accurately in, in that that limited awareness that he he has or the movie has of itself is like we want to move away from the declension narrative because these days you're not really supposed to tell that story anymore in the neoliberal milieu of like injury based identity politics. Right. You're not supposed to do that anymore with like native stories or like black stories or like queer stories or women's stories. And so he's at least very aware of that very crass um, kind of cynical liberal identity politics, but it not it doesn't like escape me that this movie came out on October twentieth, which was like two weeks after you know Palestinians in Gaza broke out of their open air prison, and the unbelievable and the unimaginable violence of settler colonialism um, that is packaged into like Israeli nationalism has been on full display right since then. And we're in this moment. I feel like we're in this moment where settler colonialism, as we said in earlier podcasts has its whole ass out. And that this movie is like the U S version of what's happening in Palestine, where it's just like such a hyper concentrated example of like the intense hatred of indigenous people that fuels like the United States and its imaginary of itself. And that obviously fuels Israel and its imagination of itself, that these two things are coming out in the fall of 2023 to really lay bare and to show the true colors of the amount of force and violence and brutality that is required, particularly um, against indigenous people and indigenous bodies in order for settler colonialism to reproduce itself or to continue on with the fiction of its existence. Um, Cause it's hard. It's hard to manufacture consent when there's been a lot of truth telling about the fact that you're on stolen land, the fact that you've violated all treaties that have ever been struck, 
you know, when Native people are finally telling these stories very powerfully um, in international pop culture forums, like TV shows and such, I'm talking just about the United States, but I had made this connection in my mind literally right after watching the movie. And I was like, this is such a bizarre moment to be in where it's like, yeah, we're not doing the declension narrative anymore, but now it's just like the settler colonialism of like the 19th century has become like repopularized <laughs> in pop culture in the U S or just like the genocide of Palestinians is like kind of blood sport entertainment, you know, on like international news and especially the way that it's narrated in American media. It's like, it's just war. It's just the Indian wars are like in full swing in this moment, I guess is what I think this movie represents to me at least. And I, I like, you know, if you if you look at so the other hugely popular um, movie made by a white guy with serious um, heteropatriarchal toxic masculinity issues is Dances with Wolves, and that was a declension narrative, and that was a white savior. This this has some white saviorism in it too. With with is it Jesse Plemons who plays the FBI guy? Um, yeah. Um, so, but you have that film and then at the very end, and we talked about this in that, in that podcast, at the very end, when you have that, um, narrative scrolling across the screen, um, you know, in, in, um, 1868, the last ban of free Sioux submitted to white authority at blah, blah, blah. Those dates could be wrong. I could be hallucinating. Um, but I do remember it said specifically the great horse culture of the plains had passed into history. So declension narrative also like this was great. It was over and there are no more um, Lakota and, you know, okay, tie it all up with a nice pretty bow. On this film, which doesn't utilize the declension narrative, but has some a really fucked up first five minutes that we've talked about. Um, you have this um, acknowledgement that through the fact that these these the, these white male characters are so horrible, you have this acknowledgement that there were there was some awful people who did awful things at this one time and place in history. But then the FBI came in and saved the day and everybody lived happily ever after. Molly got remarried. She had other children. She survived being poisoned by her husband, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you have this one moment and then it's acknowledged. So now we can all move on, except that we're not moving on because what it doesn't acknowledge is that the systemic issues that created the situation um, in in Osage country, and I think it was Pahuska. Were they in Pahuska? Um, I could be wrong about that, but I, I think it was Pahuska. So those those conditions that created these alternative versions of genocide are still in existence, and this the the allotment act um but also blood quantum and um the the you know there are many ways to genocide and one of them is by creating conditions in which human beings can't live like when you have extractive industries when you have like uranium mining when you have coal when you have um uh fracking and those are also ways that are genociding native people. And so you're, you're sweeping this all to the side by just acknowledging one moment in history. And that's why, you know, I think, you know, we said before, this is not the story, this story needed to be told, but this is not the way it should have been told. And if you want to talk about what happened in Oklahoma and you want to talk about everything that continues to happen, then I think you need to address the structural issues of settler colonialism and how it's always been about land grab and it's about erasing and making invisible um, the First Nations because if you want the land, you have to remove the people. 
And like, that's just it, right? I There needs to be, I would actually love to see a real documentary, like an Osage produced documentary about this that isn't like some famous, like white people, white dudes um, who come from an elite class in Hollywood fumbling into the story and making making a movie that's just about settler white settler masculinity accidentally i would actually like to see something <laughs> about this horrific chapter in like the larger structure of dispossession and settler violence against native women and the land that is from an osage perspective that is extremely conscious of settler colonialism and that is able to tell that story from that perspective. Because that would be a way different story. And it certainly wouldn't create a spectacle like the movie did, like what we now, we currently have through Killers of the Flower Moon of like really, really intense violence, really like really intense hatred of indigenous people. Um, and that's the last thing that I wanted to mention you know, like Anna, the sister who is outspoken and this is Molly's, one of Molly's sisters. She's murdered. Her body is found several days later in a ravine. And then you're like, without any explanation, there's these like scenes where Molly is called to identify her sister's body. And she does and her sister, the body, there's like a few shots of the body and the body is already decomposing but it's it's a bit torn apart but then there's this bizarre scene so her body's on ice if i remember in a box and in front of the entire molly's sitting there and then there's all these other people from the community mostly white people and there's a man and you don't i don't know if he's the doctor who's sawing her skull in half and you can molly's like remembering the sound of the sawing and then you find out in other scenes later on throughout the movie as they solve the murder um, when the FBI show up that they, I apologize to Native people and particularly Native women who are listening to this because this is extremely graphic. Trigger warning, trigger warning. Um, apparently they removed her face. They took, they peeled Anna's face away from her skull and they mangled her brain and they chopped her up and dismembered her. And then they peeled her skin off with an ax. And the reason they give is that they were trying to find the bullet, right? Because she was shot in the head. And there's no explanation as to why Anna has been treated this way. There's a moment where like, Ernest is talking to the funeral director, funeral parlor director, and I, he's like, oh, Molly wants to have an open casket and that's more expensive. And Ernest is like, she can't have an open casket because she doesn't got no face. Like Anna's though doesn't got no face. And, you know, um, the reason why I'm like narrating this. So first of all, there's no context and there's no, dis there's no reason given for this kind of brutality that is visited upon Anna. Um, I was recently attacked by some right wingers. It made like national news. I was thinking like Newsweek and Fox News and stuff like that for some comments I made at a Red Nation teaching on December 3rd in Minneapolis about like dismantling settler colonialism in the United States, decolonization and such. And some of the hate mail I got, I remember one in particular was from, it was most, all, almost all of it was from white men, first of all. I say like 90% of the hate mail I got was from white men. Even the ones who were pretending to be anonymous, I could totally tell were white men. One told me that I deserved to be chopped up into pieces. I got called a loudmouth bitch a lot. I got called a squaw a lot. Um, and I, and after I watched Killers of the Flower Moon, I was like, oh my God, I think all these haters maybe watched that movie and then pulled all of the hyper racist and sexist things they said to me um, that are directed specifically at native women. And these, these emails I got, I got them into my university inbox, but then I thought more about it. And I was like, no, like the reason why 
me and in 20, this happened a month ago. So this happened like 30 days ago, December of 2023, I'm getting this kind of response for being a loud mouth native woman <laughs> in public is the exact same reason why Anna got that response and was treated that way in Killers of the Flower Moon. And it's not a coincidence, right? Because the structure of settler colonialism is premised upon this kind of, it's not even dehumanization, it's actually something much more sinister. And it goes deep into the psyche of white settler masculinity. And I think that speaks to the film. The film is literally like the unconscious of the settler masculine present of today, like 2024 in the United States. It is not something that belongs in history. What we are seeing, like Killers of the Flower Moon very much represents what settler colonialism is today. And especially like the kind of world that native women have to navigate today as they had to do, as our ancestors have had to do for hundreds of years. There's no safety. There's no safety for Native women because the entire fucking project is premised upon our annihilation. You know? The, the FBI did the same thing. I mean, almost the same thing to Anna May Aquash. And when you look, like, they cut off her hands. And so, like, this, this dismemberment of Native of native female bodies and this desire to do that is is at you know the basis of settler colonialism because it it represents the 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 dismemberment of the land and the separation of the land and the and the um the land being chopped up and given to white male settlers so it's just, it's the same thing. It's been happening. So it's happening in the early 20th century. It's happening in the in the uh, late 20th century. And it's still happening today. So this is this has just been a continuing line from the very first moment that that settlers set foot on on uh, on this land. And the structure itself has evolved, but it hasn't really changed. And it's it's scary because yeah that is that is why this movie fucked me up so bad as a native woman watching it because i was like holy god this is this is our present tense like this right here and like the intensity and the concentration of it because i have experienced it recently i was like damn like this is this is really what is happening right now um liberalism tries to convince us that settler colonialism is more compassionate and has like a nicer face. But as Elizabeth Cookland used to say, like the Indian wars never ended. And that's what I'll just like end on. Thank you. I mean, it's really like, it's hard to like say the words, like the, the carving up and the cutting a woman's, a native woman's body into pieces and scattering it is meant to completely dismember, you know, like, the integrity of who all indigenous people and indigenous nations are to make it impossible for us to put the pieces back together so that the project of settler colonialism is finished, right? So it can finally claim to be finished in a historical moment where native people are rising up, I would say at least in Turtle Island, especially over the last decade that the Red Nation has been in existence in a way where we are seeing a renaissance of indigenous resistance and that land back is like a real thing and that this is apparently incredibly threatening to the settler order of things and to the white men, 80% of whom own, own all private property in the United States. And that property only became private property owned by white men through the theft <laughs> of indigenous, um, the indigenous commons and indigenous stewardship of that land of the kind we see in Killers of the Flower Moon. And so this movie is very much representative, I think, of where we are right now. And especially because of what's going on in Palestine, the violence I've never seen in any, even in a John Wayne movie, I have never seen 
this amount, this volume, and this spectrum of hatred of indigenous people represented in any film or any television show in the entire fucking history of Hollywood. Killers of the Flower Moon has more violence against native people of all kinds than any other single product of any kind in the history of Hollywood. And the fact that that has come onto the big screen and come out and it's been nominated for Oscars in 2024 should tell you, it should tell you what the status is of the settler response to this profound moment of uprising where native women like you and me are at the forefront of this renaissance of resistance and the renewal of our struggle for land back and sovereignty and nationhood and self-determination. It is not a coincidence that this film portrays that, that it is, it is really, I keep, keep calling the settler unconscious, but it's like, it's more like the settler anxiety. The film is really about the anxiety and the fragility that white settler masculinity feels in this moment literally carved into the bodies of the native women in the movie and into the heart and the psyche and the very being of Molly played by Lily Gladstone. As we're watching indigenous people of Palestine, women and children especially also being mutilated in front of the entire world and the profound disgusting anxiety settler anxiety coming out of that. And what settlers are willing to do to protect that bankrupt, disgusting system. Yep. Everything you just said, and like, I, I mean, this was my jam when I was in college. So I watched all of those awful old movies. And John Wayne, you know, was a disgusting racist um, and a misogynist and all of those things. And it, you know, he was able to, to perform in, in his films because that's the way they were written because racism was, was, was the accepted modality of the time. And you look at things like Cheyenne Autumn and, um, and what it said about native people and how it displayed native people and um, the just the Westerns of the time. And then 30 years ago, you know, we had Dance of the Wolves and it was, you know, the, a neoliberal wet dream, like um, let's apologize through this film for everything that was done to the Lakota and, you know, let's, let's um, have this white savior who finds the only white woman left on the plains of South Dakota and um, elevates her in the film. Um, and there were so many things that were so bad about that film. And, you know, it was a declension narrative, but you're right. The difference 30 years makes. So the difference it makes with um, the number of narratives that are being created by native people, the positions of power in this settler, gov settler government that are now being held by native people, the number of, of um, writers and actors and content creators that are indigenous now um, in 30 years has, has increased. You have things like um, and I keep bringing up reservation dogs because I think that's the standard to which many things are going to be held now. And you have anxiety and this anxiety. I mean, Scorsese could have stayed with all of his mafia films and, you know, and his, his gang, they're not all about Italians. Some of them are about Irish, but you have, you know, he could have stayed with that um, template and made a whole ton of money. But what he has unconsciously created is a manifestation of the anxiety of settler colonialism now that they're being faced with 
um, an uprising and um, a, a, a huge number of native people standing up and saying, we will not back down. We want land back. We want to be treated with dignity and respect. We're going to tell our stories within your um, areas. We're invading the areas held by white settlers. And we don't care what you think. And we don't care that this movie was, um, was nominated for all of these awards and Reservation Dogs got nothing. Because you know what, motherfuckers? Time Magazine named it the top, number one show of last year. And every other honor that they got, none of which were these fabulous things like Grammys and I don't know what they're, Emmys and all that. But it is now a standard that is being held up in a typically white purview. So this anxiety has been coming for a long time. Like this started right after Dancing with Wolves. And now we're, we're seeing this manifested in this movie. And what better way to display it than by the gratuitous amount of violence against Native people, particularly women, but there were men in there who were killed as well. So I think, and then you had, I mean, I do think Lily Gladstone really took this in a direction it never would have gone had she not had that role. So I think in a way it was also her and by extent the rest of Native people saying, you can do what you want. You can say what you want. You can show what you want about us, but we're here. We're strong. We're proud and we're not going anywhere. So do what you want, but don't turn around because when you do, you're going to see we're all behind you and we're all smiling and we're moving forward. We're not gonna let this... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yeah. so definitely the anxiety. I absolutely agree with, with it. This is the, the epitome of settler anxiety as to what's going on in the world now. And whew. dang, you said it so good. Ugh, I got chills. I swear. I swear. Killers of the flower moon. It isn't just even about the politics of representation. It's not even about native people having representation. It is, it is a literal manifestation of like where we are now. And it's an ugly picture. It's an ugly picture for settlers. Settlers, settler ontology is ugly by definition because it's based on theft, but an insanity. <laughs> But, and violence, it's all, it's just pure violence. Actually, it's pure violence. Settler ontology is pure violence. But Lily Gladstone and what she, the counter narrative that she brought to that character, ooh, it's about strength and it's about power. And it's about like, it's about more than resilience and survival. It's about like reclaiming something. Even, even in like, the most dangerous, perilous conditions that settler colonialism puts puts us in as Native women and as Native people. And that all said, like, fuck the Oscars, but I really hope she wins. She, whew, she deserves it, but also she deserves to be celebrated by Native people and by Native women, especially. She did more. She did more than just represent that story. She literally, again, carried like history, the entire history and burden of indigenous resistance to settler colonialism through that character. It's fucking epic. And she was, she was making sure that, that everyone knew the strength of native women and the sovereignty. I mean, ultimately she, she had sovereignty no matter how bad they beat her and tried to kill her, she stood up at the end and she she went her own way. So, yeah, kudos. I hope she wins too. Um, and I, I hope that um, that she and all Native filmmakers, Native actors um, are, are given roles that will show 
the incredible strength and power and pride and dignity of native people. And, you know, a little plug, although I've only watched one episode echo. Um, I think we may have to talk about that at some point because I'm seeing, um, just how native filmmakers can, can take a story and infuse it with native values and, and native worldview. And, and boy, this Killers of the Flower Moon wasn't it, but, but native people are doing that. And kudos to everyone out there who's working hard at this because it's a thing. The only thing about Echo is an Echo on Disney Plus and like Disney is like a major, it's like at the top of the list for BDS, I guess, to boycott. That's, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's my only reservation. I, I mean, I don't know who produced, it's a Marvel movie, right? Or it's a Marvel series, but it's made for Disney. It is a Marvel series. Yeah. So. Uh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe they'll have it somewhere else. Maybe they'll, they'll uh, export it somewhere else. They should. Maybe we can ask them to because yeah someplace that's not so so um supportive of genocide yeah because that's a bad well this was a good convo i feel like i i got everything out <laughs> i needed to talk about on my feels you uh you were able to to uh um get rid of all of that angst that was caused by watching this movie oh, yeah God. i got all the the evil out <laughs> I literally I did, smudged I did. off after I watched the movie. <laughs> I did this in Oppenheimer the same week. <gasps> what? Also, Oppenheimer has more Oscar noms than any other movie. Two. This is, I can't. These two movies. Can't believe these two movies came out in 2023 and are both celebrated. Sick, man. Yeah. Man. Yep. Southern colonialism is sick. Yep. It's trying to narrate its like greatest hits. <laughs> and that's that's a good way of putting it. I absolutely I I agree. I mean, seriously, like like Oppenheimer was very disturbing, and um, as it, well, obviously, people who are watching listening to this know as as a communist, it's really hard to watch those those scenes um, of, you know, the um, anti-communism and, and McCarthyism that was happening. Um, also, just the way white people circle jerk around, you know, this, this idea of communism and what the fuck difference would it make if he was a communist or not? I mean, he created a weapon of mass destruction. He's going to hell. Oh yes, I forgot about hell. Um, Scorsese and and it's going to hell, and yeah. Oppenheimer is going to hell. So who cares if they're communists or not? <laughs> maybe maybe that's like the the final judgment on every um, RPH episode going forward. It's like, is this person going to hell? Or not? going to hell yeah for sure <laughs> well i haven't yet watched oppenheimer for the same reason i didn't want to watch killers of the flower moon for the same reason i didn't watch that was a hard one too yeah mm -hmm. well maybe we'll have to do a a, a deep dive into taylor sheridan at some point <laughs> Anyway, we've—I mean, we've trashed Taylor Sheridan before, but I'm—I'm I'm happy to do that again. Well, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Um, like Elena said, I think this last portion of our conversation is on Patreon for patrons only. So if you're listening to this, you're obviously a patron. Thank you so much. Um, we'll be back soon with another episode of RPH. I'm not sure what we're going to focus on, but we'll figure it out. It'll okay. be great. Yeah. So look forward to it. Alrighty. Thanks everyone for Thank listening. Till next time.